Nintendo, Sega, Atari, the giants of gaming throughout the 1980s. I focus on them here, but all of this material has been explored and exposed in considerable depth by others already. Yeah, even Virtual Boy and SG-1000. I hope that my video essays manage to glean new details, present new insights about these platforms and their games, but ultimately these systems are reasonably well documented online and show up even just as passing mentions in many game retrospectives. But what about Japan's would-be giant? What about the company whose console efforts beat Nintendo and Sega's systems to market by a matter of years? What about the company that graced Japan's invaders-obsessed audiences with two robust consoles and a cartridge-based handheld system all by the middle of 1984? In short, what about Epoch? Welcome to NES Works Guide in Epoch. Welcome to NES Works Guide in Epoch. You rarely hear much about Epoch as a gaming entity in the West. Note that's Epoch, not Epic, because they never really had much presence here. Aside from some wildly successful Game & Watch clones, most notably the million-plus selling Pac-Man handheld clone Epoch Man, which even my destitute little family owned a copy of, Epoch mostly stuck to the Japanese market. In some senses, Epoch created the Japanese console market. Nintendo always gets the nod for the way the Famicom's tremendous success turned video games into a major commercial force. But according to former Epoch designer Masayuki Horie, in a 1997 Game Odyssey interview translated by the always brilliant Schmupplations, Epoch primed the pump for Famicom. The company laid the groundwork for what was to come in the early to mid-1980s, starting way back in the mid-1970s. Not only did the company flourish in the post-invaders years, but even before that. Epoch sold Japan's very first domestically produced game system, a TTL-based Pong clone called TV Tennis. From there, Epoch shifted to LSI-based clone systems, including an Invaders clone called Battle Vader and a TV baseball game. Epoch imported and sold the Atari VCS in Japan beginning in 1978, half a decade before Atari itself took a belated crack at the Japanese market with 1983's Atari 2800 rebranding. Although Epoch's VCS only found moderate success among Japanese consumers, Horie claims to have prompted Atari to license and develop their own version of Space Invaders for the console. If that's true, Epoch didn't simply pave the way for Japan, but played a key role in the rise of gaming in the US, too, as most historians credit Space Invaders with having been the VCS's critical breakthrough moment in the West, the point at which the console made the transition from interesting novelty to bona fide hit. As the 1980s dawned, Epoch decided to get into gear by adapting its standalone TV systems into a transitional console called the Cassette Vision. While it did reasonably well for itself by the standards of the day, the system ultimately was doomed to good but not incredible sales by a few factors. For starters, Epoch took an unconventional approach to console engineering by building their new system around their existing TTL standalone consoles. Unlike the Fairchild Channel F and Atari 2600, the console didn't house a CPU or memory. Rather, it functioned as a video connector, a controller housing, and a power supply for the actual guts of the machine, which each cartridge contained inside. Yes, the Cassette Vision cart contains what should be the guts of the console. Not just the game data, but the processor and RAM to power it. Epoch settled on a costly and inefficient approach to manufacturing, which probably made sense up front given that most of the initial releases for the console compacted existing hardware into cartridge form, but hardly seems viable in the long term. Similarly, Epoch's development pipeline for Cassette Vision failed to set the system up for sustainable success. According to the Horie interview, the company employed a single, small team to design and engineer Cassette Vision software. The Cassette Vision library resultantly suffered from a severe bottleneck in that the Epoch dev team could only produce a single game once every three months or so. By the time the Famicom arrived two years later and outsold the Cassette Vision in short order, Epoch's system had a library of only 11 games. 11! Nintendo managed to release that many in the Famicom's first six months. Sega hit that number even faster for SG-1000. Yes, the Cassette Vision only received 11 games in total before being replaced by the Super Cassette Vision, a more powerful, traditional, and sustainable device. In this Epoch-focused side series, we're going to look at all of them. Cassette Vision, 
Super Cassette Vision, and maybe even some other odds and ends bearing the Epoch name. The Epoch console saga begins here with Cassette Vision game number one, Kikori no Yosaku. The Cassette Vision truly does reflect the hardware and software design philosophy of the standalone TTL console age. Like nearly all dedicated TV game devices, Kikori no Yosaku brazenly lifts another company's work. In this case, Epoch swiped a seminal release by SNK called simply Yosaku. Initially published in 1978, Yosaku was seemingly the first original creation by SNK after a wave of the block-breaking games that everyone attempted to peddle in the wake of Atari's breakout. Unfortunately, the original Yosaku currently exists, or rather, doesn't exist, as lost media. Most of SNK's earliest releases from the 1970s did not make their way into the company archives. Some, like Yosaku, are not known to have been archived by arcade collectors either. The closest thing we have to SNK's Yosaku is this, Epoch's clone, which, so far as anyone seems to be aware, was not licensed or authorized by SNK. This will appear as a recurring motif throughout Epoch's console history. Well, that's not completely true. SNK, or an uncredited contractor working for them, hid an homage to Yosaku in the Neo Geo Pocket Color game King of Fighters Battle Day Paradise. It's not an exact match for the 1978 original, but it follows the same setup. All you need to do to experience SNK's founding creation is to buy a language-intensive Japan-only board game and attempt to play it on a monochrome Neo Geo Pocket system, which also was never released in the US. This will cause the game to boot directly into the Yosaku homage. So easy, right? There's something frustrating about knowing that a seminal release from one of gaming's most important forces has been lost, and that the closest equivalent to the original experience can only be had on someone else's console in a cartridge that ripped off SNK's work wholesale. On the other hand, this situation does underscore the value of piracy and wanton disrespect for intellectual property when it comes to keeping old media alive. There's a certain irony in the fact that Kikori no Yosaku is so defiantly unlicensed because one of the key selling points for SNK's Yosaku had to do with the fact that the company actually went to the trouble of making certain their game was on the up and up. SNK drew Yosaku's premise from a 1978 hit song by the same name, in which Saburo Kitajima told the tale of a woodcutter toiling at his work. SNK evidently included a bar of Kitajima's song in the game, which they licensed from Jazzrack, the Japanese equivalent of America's ASCAP Musical Rights Management Authority. This made Yosaku one of the first video games, if not the first, to bear the official seal of Jazzrack which would show up on other coin-op releases like Konami's Shinyu Shain Toru-kun for the Beatles' A Hard Day's Night and Sega's Super Locomotive for Yellow Magic Orchestra's Raiden. Kikori no Yosaku for Cassette Vision seemingly carries forward the music, which plays as a little ditty at the outset of a new game. Though it does not carry the Jazzrack label. Epic definitely took a Honey Badger approach to IP rights with this. Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey Badger don't care. That said, it seemingly paid off for them. By many online accounts, their version of Yosaku sold remarkably well and helped lift their console to pretty solid sales. Wikipedia cites several Japanese sources that indicate the system sold nearly half a million units overall, which makes it by far the biggest console to hit the Japanese market before Famicom came along. Cassette Vision wasn't Japan's first cartridge-based console by any means, but it certainly saw the greatest popularity at the time, and it owed a good portion of that success to the appeal of Kikori no Yosaku. I can see why. Although the Cassette Vision seems a little visually primitive for a 1981 release if you compare it to, say, the Intellivision, Yosaku makes good use of the controller's capabilities. It builds its visual tableau clearly, presenting players with a woodcutter, a pair of trees, and various hostile critters. Although the graphics reflect the system's unique graphical display quirk, which causes a sort of color knockout effect on diagonal sprites, the resulting angularity gives the game elements a stylized look that would help distinguish the cassette vision from contemporary machines. Kikori no Yosaku differs from SNK's Yosaku in that its woods contain only a pair of trees for the player to chop down rather than a trio, and by all accounts, this makes for an easier game. The original Yosaku being lost media, I can't exactly offer a first-person accounting of this, but sure. Gameplay in Kikori no Yosaku consists of a simple task. Cut down the trees. Yosaku the woodcutter can move left and right, jump, and swing his axe. 
You need to land a pixel perfect strike on a tree in order to score a hit, and each tree has to be struck about half a dozen times on both its left and right side before it falls. The good news is that the pixels are super chunky on cassette vision, so this isn't as demanding as it seems. You just need to get a sense of where your axe will strike and what counts as effective cutting distance. Yosaku changes his facing each time he reverses direction, an important factor in whacking things with your axe. In the classic Atari 2600 tradition, Kikori no Yosaku allows you to select from multiple game modes and difficulty levels, in this case by tapping the select button on the console to cycle through options. Game Format 1 gives you a set number of lives in which to clear the trees, moving you along to a new pair of trees and a slightly more challenging obstacle setup each time you succeed. Game Format 2 simply tasks you with clearing the two trees as quickly as possible. You have unlimited lives in this mode, but the timer continues running anytime you get knocked out and counts against your score. Within each mode, you can also choose from slow, medium, and fast game speeds. At the slowest speed, hazards move at a fairly relaxed pace. At high speed, everything in the forest moves way faster than Yosaku, which makes it difficult to avoid getting pasted constantly. As for the nature of these hazards, well, the forest doesn't really seem to appreciate having its pieces dismantled. Nature sends a variety of hazards after Yosaku to put a stop to his endeavors. Boars, vipers, falling branches, and of course, birds. If any of these manage to tag Yosaku with their attacks, he loses a life and transforms into either an angel or a cactus. Or maybe an angel that resembles a cactus? The Book of Revelations was wild, it's probably in there. The only non-fatal hazards you can shrug off are the tree branches, which merely stun Yosaku for several seconds. At lower difficulties, that's probably more an inconvenience than anything else, but at the higher difficulty levels, the branches leave you stunned longer than the cycle at which the boars and snakes appear, so you're basically left standing helplessly until you die. You can fight back against these critters though. Well, maybe not against the birds, but the snakes and boars for sure. If you smack an attacking animal with your axe, you'll take it out of the action. Okay, that's true for snakes, anyway. It seems like the same holds true for boars as well, but they move so quickly I've never been able to line one up for a successful hit. Instead, it's easier to just leap the boars as they charge. And by easier, I mean still pretty tough. Hopping over a running pig requires pretty deft and specific timing. Logically, if a bit counterintuitively for people accustomed to video games, the boar poses a threat from the front, you know, with the tusks and all. As long as you give the boar's face plenty of clearance, you can safely overlap its body as you land. This proves to be fairly critical at low speeds, since the boars move so slowly, you'll land before they pass completely. Snakes, on the other hand, are easier to smack with your axe, but the flip side is that you can't touch any portion of them safely. Really outside the timed mode and the blur of activity that is the highest speed setting, Kikori no Yosaku amounts to a test of patience. Although it's tempting to go in and try to whack a tree as much as possible and as quickly as possible, the wind down time on your swing leaves you vulnerable to attack. Measured, cautious strikes that leave you ample time to react to the threats that appear from literally every direction will get you a lot further than a manic whirl of effort. Altogether, I find myself surprised by just how much I enjoyed this simple game. Even with its primitive visuals, it delivers interesting gameplay that forces you to move with precision and act tactically. It's a great start for Epoch's console aspirations. Just like it had been a great start for SNK's arcade aspirations. It's that transitive property at work. Baseball. Is a console allowed to ship in Japan without being accompanied by a game based on our two nations' mutually shared favorite pastime? Evidently not, and that tradition began here with cassette vision and baseball. But really, baseball for cassette vision has less to do with gaming's future than it does Epoch's own past. Again, the cassette vision's unusual format contained the processor and RAM for each game in each cartridge, and baseball reveals the reasoning behind that seemingly backward approach to hardware design. Epoch made its entry into the television console market with a series of dedicated game systems, most of which cloned existing works. From what I can tell, baseball was Epoch's first big hit on that front, a best-selling adaptation of the sport that came in its own unique device when it debuted in 1978. Epoch designed its dedicated baseball console for two players. The console itself housed a series of buttons, switches, and a rotary knob for the player on defense, while the at-bat team used a wired controller that consisted of a single large button. Pressing the button swung the bat, meaning that everything else about playing offense, such as running bases, happened automatically. The fielding team, on the other hand, had considerably more control to worry about. The pitcher could throw a fast or slow pitch at one of five different angles, 
and once the ball was hit, the rotary knob would control the outfielders. Baseball for Cassette Vision is the same game. I don't mean that in the spiritual sense, I mean that literally, the game hardware contained inside the cartridge recreated the innards of the dedicated game console from three years earlier. I'm not going to crack open these bad boys to make comparisons, but I have to assume that some degree of miniaturization had to take place for this magic to become a reality. Nevertheless, Epoch makes its mission statement here. You could buy the standalone device that only played baseball for 18,500 yen, or a more versatile device for 13,500 yen, with multiple games that each clocked in around 4,000 to 5,000 yen. In other words, according to pricing data at videogameconsolelibrary.com and oldcomputers.com, a cassette vision with baseball cost less than the standalone baseball system did at launch, and cassette vision could also play Yosaku for a small additional cost, and many more games to come. Well, nine more games. And truth be told, in 1981, Epoch's baseball was still one of the better sims on the market. It stacked up well against the Intellivision and Atari 2600 versions of the sport, the former of which wouldn't even arrive in Japan until Bandai localized the Intellivision, and both American import consoles bore a vastly higher price than the Cassette Vision, making Epoch's machine considerably more attractive. Epoch shipped baseball for Cassette Vision the same year that ADK's Champion Baseball hit arcades, and it stacks up reasonably well to that slightly more refined game. The appeal of Epoch's game comes from its no-nonsense design. It's by far the fastest, most efficient take on the sport I've ever seen. The appeal of baseball for Cassette Vision doesn't really come through in direct video feed. Seen as raw footage, it appears almost comically minimalistic. When played on the actual Cassette Vision hardware, however, it turns out to be remarkably appealing. This version of the game carries forward the control scheme of the dedicated machine. Although the Cassette Vision lacks detached controllers, it otherwise translates perfectly. The Cassette Vision's built-in controls covered a variety of options. With a two-player setup that offered a Space Invaders-friendly left-right lever, two action buttons, a pair of dial controls for each player, and a few supplementary setting switches that could work as game control in a pinch. Baseball uses the left lever for batting and spreads the fielding controls across a pretty decent approximation of the dedicated console's setup. In fact, I'd speculate that this hardware's interface design was built to some degree specifically around baseball, kind of like how Nintendo built the N64's Trident around the interface needs of Super Mario 64. The lower right dial controls the outfielders, while the right set of action buttons, push 3 and push 4, dictate whether the pitcher tosses a slow pitch or a heater. Finally, the course selector, which ostensibly exists as a level or difficulty modifier, adjusts the curve of each pitch. The course switch has five settings, and its position causes the ball to veer in that direction. Set the course lever to its middle position, and you'll throw a straight pitch over the plate. At its far extremes, you'll pitch a ball to the outside or inside of the plate. Batting amounts to timing your swing. There's no need to adjust your stance or aim high or low. It's basically the opposite of 1990's Pocket Stadium for Game Boy, which would turn every pitch into something of a tactical battle. This is baseball as a mindless, rapid-fire test of reflex. If a batter manages to connect, the ball flies quickly up the screen. If it comes within range of an infielder, that fielder will automatically toss the ball to first base to tag the runner out. Or, if runners on base can be forced out, the fielder will pass to the first relevant baseman, who will continue down the line. If you manage to hit the ball past the infield, however, it'll fly into the outfield and keep on going if a fielder doesn't snag it. The defending player needs to react with split-second accuracy in order to move his outfielders into the ball's way and catch the ball. Otherwise, it flies off the screen and counts as a base hit. The CPU seemingly decides on a whim whether that base hit counts as a single, a home run, or something in between. Very little is actually left to the player here. It's simple, but the simplicity keeps the speed at maximum, allowing you to complete an entire 9-inning game in less than 10 minutes. My only complaint is that the controls don't alternate between sides of the console when each new team takes the field. That made sense for the dedicated console, where you could simply hand the batting button to the other player, but here it means you either have to swap seats with the other player, or reach across one another in a really dopey take on Twister. I get that Epoch was out to repurpose tech here, but that one tweak to the baseball LSI wiring would have been welcome. Between Kikori no Yosaku and baseball, I feel like Cassette Vision offered a pretty compelling package in the Japanese console market of 1981. More versatile than the dedicated devices of its era, less expensive than pretty much any other option, and with a pair of launch titles that ended up being way more entertaining than they had any right to, this was a damn fine offering in the pre-Famicom era. 
it's miles beyond the likes of other Japanese proto consoles like the Bandai TV Jack 8000. It wouldn't be bested until the Famicom and SG-1000 debuted two years later. Cassette Vision did not invent Japanese console games, but it represents a crucial evolutionary step in the format's development. Next time on NES Works Gaiden Epoch, familiar names and familiar faces, but not both at once.